um, once that's live and then Carson, you can see if you can share, do the watch party. Yeah. But I don't see it. Yep, we're there. Okay. Let me see. Yep. Can go on Safari and check. Um, I am. I'm actually in Safari. I'm just. And then you, you you're looking at the, the link right now. I am looking at the well on the on the Facebook on uh, on the Crown Watch blog. Do you see mm -hmm. our video there? No. Oh, well, let me refresh. Let me refresh. Yeah. No. Maybe you want to do a quick introduction while Carson, just like. You know, figures out the, 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 the Facebook. Hi, everybody. Everybody who's... Oh, yes, I see it now. Okay, okay. Yeah. Now I do the share. I share it on mine, right? Yeah, I share it on your... Share now. Okay. And then your... your yeah, it's on my timeline. It's, just, it's friends just on shared Facebook. on my timeline. Okay, excellent. Cool. Okay. Hi, everybody. Good evening from uh, this... Part of the world. Uh, if right. you are, Carson, you're in Hong Kong, are, right? I'm in Hong Kong, yes. So it's eight thirty in the evening. Eight thirty here as well. Thanks, uh, guys. You, um, whoever's joining in right now, we have a very special guest with us tonight. As he said, all the way from Hong Kong, um, his name is Carson Chan, and he is the Asia head of mission of the. FHH. Okay, I'm gonna get Carson to pronounce FHH himself because I can't do it. <laughs> FHH is Fondation de la Haute Horlogerie. It's well uh, the foundation of high-end watchmaking. Okay, and, and Carson is the head, uh, Asia head of mission, right? That sounds Correct. like a very lofty kind of position. Could you tell us a yes. bit about FHH and what you guys do? So um, the FHH is, if I have to explain it in a, in a very simple way, it's an organization that is, uh, it is non-profit and it is catered to the, um, how should I say, it? To, to the industry. So we have a lot of members. Uh, the members, at the, at the, for the time being right now, it's, it's all brands. So all the brands... Uh, you have uh, uh, quite a few of the Richmond brand, uh, some LVMH, a lot of uh, uh, independent brands, some brands from um, Kering Group. So autologically, uh, high-end watchmaking is the essential uh, requirement. So you have to be high-end. But now it's a big uh, discussion on what qualifies as high-end. So does it have to be mechanical? or does it have to be expensive or does it have to be handmade so that is a big discussion um but uh if you want to become members of the the fhh you know there is a there is a bit so sometimes you, you're like well why don't i see this brand in the fhh they are quite powerful and they are very popular well maybe 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 they don't qualify or maybe they choose chose not to join the the foundation so but it's it's served as, as the um, uh, in, industry body for high end watchmaking. Mm. Is that is that easy to understand? Uh, okay, but when, when when was this started and why was this started in the first place? It it started in it started about twenty eight years ago. Um, it was started because we needed some sort of um, organization. Uh, in fact, it has to, a lot to do with the SIHH, uh, the show, the watch fair, which I guess we will talk about in a, in a little bit. Um, so it it started at that time, and it was it it started because we need to cater to the industry, to have a little bit of um, uh, cohesiveness in in high end watchmaking. How do we communicate with brand to brand? How do we um, communicate the, the, the industry uh, technical aspect to the consumer? 
So more and more now we are, we are looking at the B2C factor, whereas the FHH was a, a mainly into B2B, but now we are, we are a lot of uh, B2C. Okay. So, so you primarily started as an events um, kind of a perspective, right? I mean, that was, a, that was a, the objective before? Yeah, correct. Yes. Okay. And how do people join FHH? Or how do brands join FHH? Yeah, so the brand joins the FHH for various uh, 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 factors, uh, various reasons. Um, they want to be inclusive in the watch in the in the FHH when we promote the the watch industry. You know, if you're part of it, um, especially for example, uh, the watch industry is quite unique in itself, where it is a it used to be a necessity. It went from a necessity to an accessories. I think it's unique because almost no other product on the market that went through that transformation. Because today, I think you, we can all agree that you know a, a, a mechanical watch is absolutely nothing to do with necessity. It's it's all because you want it, not because you need it. So. Um, the FHH is here to really to to how how do we how do we appreciate a mechanical piece? How do we um, uh, talk about a mechanical piece? So this is something that we are we are working very hard. And for the so the watch industry, roughly about you know two hundred some years in, in terms of wristwatches, right? Um, and and pocket watches, but it is only up until the last four or five years, we have a, how should I say, we have a, a very structured way to um, certified uh, professional individuals. Uh, whereas in the wine industry, in, if you are an accountant, if you are a lawyer, you have the industry body to say, okay, you are up to a certain level. So FHH is the one, only one for the time being that is able to certify uh, an individual for their professional um, uh, uh, knowledge, the level mm -hmm. of their professional knowledge uh, in high-end watchmaking. Um, mm -hmm. So this started about four years ago. Uh, and before that, you, anyone could call themselves a, a watch expert. I'm sure you have friends among your circle that say, oh, you know, so-and-so, he is a watch expert, but I feel that, you know, today there are a lot of um, misunderstanding of people who are very good with model numbers, <laughs> price, discount, uh, and they would be uh, seen as a watch expert. But to me, it, it, it goes a little bit more than that. It has mm -hmm. to be understanding of the, the historic, the history side of watchmaking, the technical side, um, the material that is being used, and also the artistic side of, of watchmaking. So in the FHH Academy, uh, we provide this type of, of, of knowledge to used to be uh, industry professional, but starting 2019, we have pushed it to B2C platform. So consumer in certain areas are... Um, are able to get this information and get this training and certification. So it's wow. not very excited. It is open to public. Uh, right now, we are slowly rolling out. For example, if you live in Hong Kong, you could get this certification through the Hong Kong University at the Space Program, S P A C E, um, and it, be, it we are rolling out even more and more different levels of certification. So right now there is a three levels, and uh, if you are in the industry, in fact, in Singapore there are uh, maybe I would say a couple hundred people got certified. I know wow. that because I mainly because I did it. I went to Singapore and certified those people. That was why you were here so often to certify people. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, you have to go through. Think of it as in GMAT or like a SAT class. You could study on your own, 
enroll and then take the test or you could go to you know one of these sat class or gmat class that you you study and then you you get yourself certified so, uh, so what even you, today today for the consumer you can do that online what, what kind that, of people look for this yeah. test? like you can just take it anytime online or is that a, is there a specific you, time that you have to do it you you could but there's a you know there's a cost so you need to enroll you need to register right. you need to do several things and then you know you study prepare yourself and then and then take the test but i i, I tell you it's not easy okay you think you would think it's very it's very complicated it's complicated did you come up with the, the test the questions yourself uh, no, we didn't. I didn't. I mean, we have a team of uh, uh, we have a we have a team dedicated to to manage this uh, in Geneva. So the right. test was written by uh, many industry professional. Um, so it can get very very technical. Yeah. Okay. So so but I mean, there is a way. If, you, if, 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 if there is a way, if you are if you are an individual who are really into. Uh, um, the watchmaking world that you want to, you, you know, like just like wine, right? You don't have to, you don't have to be working in the wine industry to 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 appreciate it or to like it enough that you go actually after work you go to wine school and 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 learn about wine. So the FHH Academy is exactly catering to people with this type of passion. Wow. And, you know, a lot of information that you can get is um it, it's very much tainted i dare say tainted by the marketing jargon a lot of things that you read it's really a lot of it is is, is you know it's it's mixed in with a lot of marketing talk you want to kind of learn about you know the things without the marketing it's very un very un non-commercial unbiased factual thing this is excellent for you if you want that. Okay. So, so you what must do be with this certification. Wait, sorry. What can you do with this certification once you get it? You can, you can okay. be. You, if there, there are, okay. Let me let me put it this way. So maybe I rephrase your question to, well, who comes to this class in Hong Kong University? Right. You actually have we we have a lot of you'd be you'd be surprised we actually have about fifty percent of women coming, mm -hmm. so half the class are 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 ladies who are interested in uh, knowledge in in watchmaking. They want to make uh, a sensible choice when they are shopping for a watch. Um, people who are thinking about changing industry. Uh, I have. Uh, an, an, an accountant working in uh, in a production in, uh, in in the garment industry who wants to try to work in accounting for watch industry. So this is you know it's it's very wide. The scope is very wide. It, it, I, I can't tell. So obviously, there are collectors who wants to who wants to have a much better uh, informed, knowledge. yeah, much better not knowledge in when they shop for the next big piece, right? Mm. Can you tell us a bit about you yourself, like your journey to becoming, I guess, a watch expert? I mean, how did it all start for you? Okay, I I have to say I'm not a. I don't think I'm an expert because a lot of people know did you take more. A test? Take a test. <laughs> I I did. I, I took the test. Okay, so you're I did pass the. I did. I did pass the expert level, but I I don't. <laughs> I think there are more people. Uh, who knows a lot more? You can't. You can't know everything. I don't think no. it's, it's possible. You, you can know. My my journey is it. It actually started um, with with uh, automobiles first. So I I I I was born and raised in Hong Kong, but I grew up in California. And when you are in California, I think it's very natural that you tinker with cars. It's it's, it's like. It's like if you live in uh, if you live in uh, in Europe and you don't drink wine, that's such a waste. So I was in California and I was I was playing with cars, you know. So I got I I'm like a self-taught uh, mechanical engineer. Um, I've, I I don't have a mechanical engineering background, but you know I I, I have the, such a passion for it. I really spend the time to learn about it and and to you know 
work on my own cars and such. That um, when I decided to move back to Asia in 97, uh, I came to a um, absolute halt uh, with automobiles. And when you move back to Hong Kong from California, you know, you just forget it. You know, you, you, you couldn't even find a, a, a decent apartment size, you know, much less to say you, you have a car. So I kind of have to stop and not play with cars for a little bit. And I found, um, I was already into watches, but I, I, I didn't dive that deep into it. But, uh, you know, at that, that was the turning point for me. Um, I got myself not a watch first, but a, a watch toolkit first. So uh, then I went online and, and learned how to build your watch. You know, you, you buy a kit. At, at in, back in the days, there was, this is still the, the very early internet days, right? You can actually enroll onto a, 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 a class online. They send you a kit. You follow this course and you disassemble, reassemble, make a watch out of it. I still have the watch. Um, and that... Yeah, it's still working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gave it to my wife. Wow, amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's that. That I find it very, um, uh, very soothing for for my mechanical itch. You know, it's very, mm -hmm. it's very interesting. It's I find it very, um, uh, very uh, satisfying to to be um, working on watches, understanding watches. It has a lot has to do with um, my automotive engineering uh, knowledge. So the more you know, the the, the better, uh, the the easier that I was able to understand about watches. Right. So you didn't you didn't start with like you know oh I need to get a Rolex or an Omega or Patek and you know that's how you got into the whole game. You know you just because you liked how it worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. So I, I did, I did, I, I, I wanted to understand why is it more accurate on some pieces and why is it not as accurate on other pieces. Now, is it more expensive? Has to do with being more accurate, you know. Yeah, yeah. That so, that was more interesting for me. So speaking about the expensive part, right? Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, people just tend to think that you need to be kind of rich in the first place to or wealthy in the first place to get into watches, right? So, yeah. I mean, were you wealthy in the beginning to, to get into all this? Like, I mean, this is an expensive hobby, right? So, you know, to go into it, explore it and like go into it in such a deep way, you know, did you have deep pockets to begin with? I am, I am very wealthy in terms of friendships. <laughs> I am not. No, I'm not. I, I don't have a. I don't have a very. Uh, I don't have like an unlimited budget in terms of uh, uh, buying watches and collecting watches. My my path is very similar to uh, many of you, where you are in the beginning. You are very much affected by marketing, by friends. You know, wh whoever are you talking about. Oh, this watch is so cool. You wanted to get this, but as you as you as you get to know more. And that's why I think it's very important to to build up your knowledge, your 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 understanding about the watch industry. You become more clear in terms of what you like. Okay, mm -hmm. in the beginning, I understand everybody has to start somewhere. So in the beginning, you you probably rely on you know chat like this to talk about um, you know what is what is interesting about the watch, what is uh, what is good to buy. Common question: What can I buy to invest? Mm. Right, we get that or, a lot. Yeah. yeah, what can I buy to invest, or what can I buy so I don't lose money? Right, right. These are these are very common questions, but um, without passion, I can't answer that. I couldn't answer that because you need to kind of have a passion for it, and you are buying it because you like it. So. It's a chicken and egg, but you got to You have to build your knowledge to develop that passion, right? right? So, try to understand more about what you like about a watch. Uh, let me give you an example. I know we're going a little bit off topic, but let me give you an example. Like, um, I, I'm really a car geek. I, I like cars. One, there was one time my friend said to me, he said, "Hey Carson, you know there is 
more than one way to like cars. There's not just one way. I like to drive the wheels of it. Mm. But a lot of people like to wax it. They like to keep it clean. Some people like to, uh, 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 you know, do other things to it. I, I like to drive it. And I like to, oh, some people like to modify it. Like whatever is on the car that came with the car, they don't want it. They want to put in different parts on it. That's fine too. That's not my way. But, you know, watches are very much similar like that. So you could like a watch because um, uh, there's only one year that the six o'clock is, is red. To me, that's not, it, it's okay, it's great, it's excellent, it's very rare, but it's not mechanically interesting to me. So, you know, find your own way, understand what appeals to you. There's no right or wrong. Well, I, I guess there is one wrong way. The wrong way is that you only pure, purely um, uh, thinking about the investment angle of it. This is going to take more than an hour if I get into that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've had that investment question a lot, and uh, obviously because you know it's a it's a thing that you buy that is not cheap, right? So you know people want to think that uh, you know the, the the amount of money you saved up for and you put into a watch it is worth something in the end. But then again, like what you said, to define what that worth and what that value is is not purely in terms of you know, monetary investment that you get out of, out yeah, of it. That's yeah. why when you say that, you know, you you got to develop passion and build knowledge for this yeah. hobby, uh, yeah. that would have been an enough uh, investment uh, into the into the watch that you buy. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me let me give you a quick example. Um, I I don't know if you ever, some of you may know that I used to run an auction house uh, prior to joining the FHH. So at the auction house, I see this a lot. Uh, people who are buying to invest versus people who buy because of the passion. So mm -hmm. passion, you, you, can, you, can, you really need the time and the effort to develop. So I'll give you an example. There's a guy who came in to buy a painting purely based on someone telling them that this artist is, is on the rise um, you know, you're going to make a certain percentage, you know, if you keep it for several years. So he bought this painting really not to his taste, not matching his house. He couldn't really hang it in his house, bought it, kept it for 10 years. And then guess what? The, 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 the prediction was wrong. So in 10 years, he sold it for the same amount of money. He didn't make anything versus the other guy who bought a painting because he loved the painting, he likes it, his children loved it, he hanged it in his house, he hanged it for 10 years, he had joy, the kids grew up around this painting, family grew up, they moved out, and finally he came and he needs to sell this painting for $20,000 less. Who, who gained? It's the mm -hmm. latter person, because he enjoyed the painting for 10 years, for mm -hmm. 20000 right? Whereas the first guy, he had to probably pay storage to keep it for 10 years where, you know, nothing really happened to it. So, you know, it's a, it's a perspective. I think it's important to have this perspective, to enjoy the watch, to understand what it is. Again, knowledge, without knowledge, it's very difficult to get into it in a very deep end. Mm -hmm. I think knowledge is, is, is everything in terms of collecting watches. So while we're talking about watch appreciation, you know, if we look back over the past two decades or so, you know, how would you say that watch appreciation has evolved or how have taste and buying habits changed? In the past 20 years, I think two things that spike up. First, independent brands. Uh, you really, 20 years ago, there were no independent brands. It's, mm. it's all about um, the, the, the brands with heritage, brands right. with history. And I, and, I ha and I dare say Richard Mill opened this door for everybody else to, to come through. Uh, and I was very lucky enough to be working with, uh, with the brand uh, in 2004, 2003, 2004. And I, I lived through this opening of this door. So it was, a, it was an amazing journey. 
It was very, it was very, it was a once in a lifetime uh, experience. The mm -hmm. second thing is the spike of um, uh, vintage watches. So again, the vintage watches, you still have many school of, of vintage pieces. You have, you have a, a group of people who are just one brand, one single brand, one single model, and they dive very, very deep into it. Uh, you know, whether the, there is this extra mark on the dial, there is a one year only, how the dial evolved, how does it oxidize? That has a lot to do with the, the, uh, the appearance of the watch. Okay, so again, we are talking about uh, with the independent brand, which is pushing to um, uh, time telling techniques. How do you how do you read the time? Um, material application. How do you how do they come up with the new material? Um, uh, uh, mechanical side of it. How are they using new material in terms of uh, in, in new mechanical application? Whereas the, the vintage side, it's about the heritage, the history, the story. It's very, it's very far apart, but mm. both have gone up tremendously in the last 20 years. Mm. So can that, we just, to me, that, uh, that's my observation. Sorry, can we just go back to, to Richard Mill? Uh, you said uh, Richard Mill opened the door for independent brands and you were working in Asia to open the doors for Richard Mill back in 2003 four. or four right 2003 2004 yeah yeah so can you just give us a sense of what it was at that time uh in 2003 and 2004 what was the appetite oh, it was like it was amazing because 2003 when i that's when i when we first met right yeah yeah <laughs> that was sars in asia that was SARS, yeah. there was SARS, and now we have COVID yes. now now we have COVID 19. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't meet so often. Dude. <laughs> but uh, it, it was it was it was SARS in Hong Kong. It was the economy was 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 quite bad. So again, thinking about buying a watch is like the last thing on anyone's mind. Um, how do we take a brand from an an unknown? A lot of people can't even pronounce the the name. Richard Millet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Richard Millet, Richard. Is it Millet Richard or Mao? Richard Millet? Or, or, so how do we take that? It's a, it's a lot of, uh, first of all, the brand itself is an excellent, excellent product uh, that they provide. Um, the principal of the brand, Richard himself, is an excellent marketing person. He's very good with, with, with the, 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 uh, the aspect of how he promotes the product. Also, a very, um, uh, very good in terms of uh, using new technology, new application, new material into the watch, creating a, 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 a new, a new product. It's an old product, but with a new, uh, new twist to it. And that just, it's just the timing, the product. The, the the way that we were able to 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 communicate with the the audience the, the consumer it just exploded in a very short period of time I would say Richard Mill started in 2000 okay so when I joined it was about three four years old mm -hmm. still quite relatively unknown but uh, by 2007 it was it was it was starting the domino effect has already started, so it became, it became what it is today. It, it's 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 very much you know a lot of the people who are passionate about watches are also Richard Mill collectors. Mm. So, and uh, just to follow up on what you said just now uh, about the spike in vintage watches, like building the the interest in watch collecting. So, this seems like a phenomenon over the past like three four years, I would say. Or was it more, more, more? On the, in the past three, four years? Yeah, mm. it it's been steadying. It's been steadily creeping up, but more in the past three or four years, particularly because of some of the gigantic pieces that was sold at auctions. Right. Mm. So several things cost us. Auction house become more and more popular. 
I mean, 20 years ago, you could count all the auction house with one hand. Now we have more auction house. Auctions become a little bit more, uh, less, I would say, exclusive. It becomes more uh, uh, approachable. Uh, and also, in terms of vintage piece, the vintage factor, I, I was saying earlier, you need this passion. You need passion and knowledge. Vintage needs even bigger passion and bigger knowledge to get into it. So there is this fun factor and there is this, you know, treasure hunting mm -hmm. factor uh, it makes it very addictive, very um, interesting, very fun. You would try and see. So I, I think it would be safe to say, I, I don't think you see a lot of rookies new to watches start off with vintage. I, I'm sure there are some, but I, I would say um, most of the people who start off would probably would, you know, tinker with modern watches first and then slowly move into uh, vintage pieces. So right. combined with these, all these factors, it makes it, you know, it, it is where it is today. Hmm. I mean, when we're talking about vintage watches, there's also the pre-owned market. And mm. now, you know, we see a lot of mainstream brands even legitimizing this market. Yeah. What would you think about that? I think it's great. I think um, the brand needs to show a little bit of support to their own product. Mm -hmm. um, uh, taking care. I mean, look at, I, I, I keep using cars, right? Look at the look at Porsche. Look at Ferrari. Now they have the heritage department. They have the classic department. They come back to produce parts for those cars that's 50, 60 years old. That that I think that is the right direction. Instead mm -hmm. of just trying to ignore and not take care of those customer, because those customer secures the the the, the loyalty to the brand. Um, and if you provide the service to the, those customers, I mean, they would be, they will, they will follow you forever. I am, uh, I am, I am also into some vintage pieces, and I find it extremely comforting, knowing that the brand actually is backing their used and vintage pieces. Where I know I can get it serviced, I know I can get parts if I need it. So right. I, I think it's a, it's a great, and also now you have these um, more developed platform to deal with uh used pre-owned pieces can again can you, yeah sorry can you can you just give uh you know us a um an insight into why brands were against it in the first place the pre-owned market not specific to vintage i, I don't think it, i don't think it's against it i i think it's not really supporting it because they are busy developing new product we are here to innovate, not you know. But the, now there is a is a market. The, the market, as I as we said ten minutes earlier, about the vintage and all that. I, I think simply they cannot ignore it. So but you think know, that the the pre owned market would cannibalize the sales of their new products. Perhaps that's why they were a bit hesitant about it. Um, or is that a different market altogether? I don't. I don't see. I don't see it that way. I mean, I don't even see it if, if a used watch would cannibalize the, the new watch because all it will do is actually help drive the new market. If you, if you have a way to sell your old watch, then you buy a new watch, right? If there's no way to, to sell an old watch, you probably can't, you know, don't have a way to, to buy it. So I think, I think, I think if anything, the, the pre-owned market is to help it. Mm. Then there's also the, you know, if I can buy a watch brand new for twenty thousand dollars, and then six months later I can get it for thirty percent less, that 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 might be something that the brands would be kind of wary of, doesn't it? Well, if that's the case, I mean, think about fashion. Do you ever go and uh, buy a? an Italian jacket thinking that you're going to get, you know, I don't think you can even get half, half as you walk out of the, the boutique. <laughs> so it's a, first of all, it is a consumer product. Keep, keep, let's keep that in mind. It's a, it's a consumer product. Um, it might, it might, 
it might have a little bit of gain once it goes beyond the, 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 the depreciation time. It's like a car. A lot of people thinking that they want to buy a watch and flip it. I, I don't, I'm not saying no. I'm saying, okay, let me give you this example. A lot of people talk about how I bought a watch for um, six months. I, 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 no, they, they usually say, oh, my friend. My friend bought a watch and, you know, he turned around, he made this much money, you know. Is it, is it possible? Well, yes, it is possible, but can you do it? I mean, if you have to ask me, I would say, no, you, you, you couldn't do it. Um, imagine these very limited pieces, these very highly sought after pieces. They are probably sold through the boutique, right? Um, they're probably sold to their very loyal customer who has been buying from them for years, pieces after pieces every week, probably. So, you know, you know, you can't just get to understand one part of that story and ignore the whole part of it because that is a huge learning curve. I don't think they can, they can just say, okay, oh, my friend, you know, what I call this is uh, the weekend casino gambler, weekend gambler. Everybody mm. tells you, oh, I went to Vegas last week. I went to uh, uh, Marina Bay last week and, uh, and it was, uh, I, I won. I, I want a lot of money. You know, you rarely hear people telling you that, oh, man, I, I lost so much money. You know, it's, it was a bad experience. Everybody tells you that they are, they are, they are winning money. So you, you get a lot of these story about how they, uh, people are actually making a lot of money buying new watch and sell. I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm saying it's possible, but you got to do, you got to pay your, 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 your dues, yeah. your tuition, right? So... Mm go with the the 95 percent of the population and learn the way i i promote watches as as a as a cultural activity not not a not an investment uh, angle yeah i mean that that is very tempting to want to buy something and sell it for three months later for 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 a huge profit and uh from what we understand speaking to collectors that's something that's quite frowned upon you know uh, a lot of what they call Again, like, I, I, a true I collector. I do, I'm not against uh, selling. I'm not against selling because many people have a limited resource. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you can't keep everything. You know, uh, I, I like to keep everything. I can't keep everything. But so sometimes somewhere down the road, you might need to sell something. And that's fine. And maybe you bought something and you regret buying it and you need to sell that's mm. fine, but I'm saying don't start off with thinking about you know investing in it. You know mm. there are a lot of things to invest in, much more uh, easier than watches because uh, and a lot less riskier. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So uh, it's a hobby. Um, you know, don't kill the hob don't kill the fun out of, mm. out of this hobby, right? So we're gonna ask you a general question now. So, I mean, you've been working in watches for like 20 years. What is the best thing that you actually love about being in the business? My, uh, in the watch business? In the watch business, yeah. I, I love it because I think uh, it's a combination of several things. The people, uh, the, the energy in the industry, and the room to grow. This is, this is amazing, okay? Um, a lot of people view watches as an obsolete item. A lot of people tell me that, oh my goodness, Apple Watch is going to kill you. Uh, the, the, the phone is, is performing much more accurate than a watch. I mean, if, you are, if you're still thinking about a watch is about accuracy, then I guess you're not, get, you're not getting the, the, the magical side of, of watch collecting. It's not about mm -hmm. the accuracy anymore. You have to have a, 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 a wider perspective, uh, understanding of the, the historic side of why was it made? How was it produced? How was it manufactured? What was it like back in the time? You know, a lot of people talk about tourbillons. You know, it's the most difficult under, uh, a complication to understand. Um, 
a tubion is like, well, why did you spend that much money in buying this? And what does it do? And a lot of people can't tell you what it does, right? But I think that the appeal or the 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 sexiness in the tubion is, you got to understand in 1801, how did the guy, how did he imagine that, you know, in a different, back in the day, that there was no electricity. There's absolutely no computer. For him to check a watch, if it's accurate or not, it will probably take days, if not weeks. So it's the, it's, the, it's the celebration of the human mind. This is what's interesting to me. I, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's amazing. Um, the industry is going through a transformation. Um, and I think a lot will happen in the next five to ten years, how the industry will transform. Mm-hmm. Um, I honestly believe that we need to go into more artistic side, cultural side of uh, a mechanical watch in order for it to survive, to, to, to move to the next decade, to the next millennium. Mm-hmm. I, I find all these very, very satisfying, very... Um, I, first of all, I'm a mechanical geek, so I, I like being around, surrounded by these topics and these this discussion about you know what what lubricant what is the shape of the gear what material these are all i love talking about these things mm, okay sorry just i want to circle back to some comments that you know some of our friends uh have been making joan said that she didn't she wouldn't have the heart to buy a watch and flip it that's why she can't make a quick buck right I have. I never have the heart to buy a watch and then flip it. Because maybe right. that's why. I never. Right. So that's yeah. talk, that talks about you know your passion and love for something, right? You save it. Yeah. Enough you buy it because it. you really want it. Yeah. It's yeah. sentimental, right? It means something to you. Yeah. Right. And then we have another comment from Wendy Yao that says, "But isn't a Daytona a sure thing?" Yes, it is, Wendy. <laughs> so, go, yes. go find me one in the uh, list price. <laughs> Then it's a sure thing. Are you wearing a Daytona just now, right? Are you wearing a Daytona one right now? I am wearing oh, a Daytona. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Wendy. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, I mean, people have well, to be... Wait, 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 wait. So, this Daytona is the Zenith El Primero ah. movement. Ah, okay. So, you know, I, I have a lot of things to tell you about the El Primero movement that why I like this particular Daytona, you know, and this is late 90s, right? And you would think like, oh, big brands all have their in-house movement and all that. But you know what? A lot of big brands, some of the biggest brand in year 2000, 1999, they, have, they do not have their own mechanical chronograph movement. They outsource it, buy it, you know, polish it, make it nice and put it in their watch. So, you know, a lot of people now talking about uh, in-house movement. This is such a marketing talk. Back in the days, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. Um, so again, I mean, you know, do your, do your research, understand that the history side of it, you'll find something interesting that appeals to you. And to me, this is because it was it was used by so many other brands and it's it's one of the best chronograph movement on the market yeah mm-hmm. and it also recently just celebrated its 50th anniversary the el primero right yes I think. that's right that's why right. yes 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 yeah. what do you think is stated now though i mean it's always been like a stop start kind of thing for the brand for the longest time right so, so uh, right so come again zenith zenith the brand yeah. has yeah. been over the years kind of like starting and stopping like you think that it's going somewhere but then it's like kind of like taking two steps one step forward and two steps back uh with every new uh, ceo new management there seems to be something like dynamic and fresh again and then it, it fizzles off again so what do you think of its uh chances so, so to speak i think i think zenith is one of the greatest uh, brand in recent years. I mean, how many, 
have you seen that you know the defy movement with the with the super high frequency that they designed uh, three years ago my goodness that that deserves a lot more attention than what it is getting because mm -hmm. for the past 200 years the the swiss lever escapement that everybody is talking about is both very uh, inefficient you know the energy uh, you, you there's too much loss of energy it almost 70 percent is lost from from one from the barrel transfer to the to the escapement it's almost 70 percent that is lost and then you have this brand new idea that came out i i actually think it's one of the greatest move that you can you can you can see in mechanical mm -hmm. watch industry um the brand did have a little bit of change so primarily uh, when it went from a small brand to the group in 2000 and then from as you said you know change of management there's different mm -hmm. types of changes different style of changes but i think uh, very much they are sticking to what they are strong in uh, mm -hmm. and i think they are in in excellent shape in recent years mm. And in, you know, we asked you earlier um, what what you like best about the industry. We have to ask you this: What do you hate most <laughs> about the watch I industry? I, I, what, I come what, into con. I, I hate the most is I come into contact with a lot of good deals. <laughs> 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 is and that is a that is a curse because you cannot take every good deal excellent deal right. um, I, you, you you know it's it's a it's a blessing but it's also a curse so i hate to uh, not be able to to buy everything that i want uh, <laughs> even at a at an excellent excellent deal um, but i think i i want to see what i want to, i don't i shouldn't say hate but I want to see a change in the way that we conduct business mm -hmm. with the watch industry all the time for at, at this moment. Right. A lot of the people um, in the industry have gone through, particularly at this moment, where the world is facing a pandemic and mm -hmm. everyone is facing an economic hardship. Um, we have lived in the past 20 years in a relatively calm, uh, in fact, smooth and very vibrant economy. A lot of the people in the, in the watch profession are not up to speed in terms of communicating with the consumer. That's why you see a lot of consumer are very well informed because of the internet, because of the, the, the information age. They are very well informed. They understand the watch sometimes even better than the person who's selling it mm. i i think there needs to be a change we need to at least bring the level of service the level of salespeople to uh, um, an acceptable level that they are able to communicate and to express the value of uh, a mechanical watch if you're still selling a watch by its function then you're doing it wrong and you're missing it you, you don't that comes secondary you need to be able to communicate in terms of the emotional value of the piece the the story behind the piece the the, the technical part comes a little bit later mm. so i i think this requires a big change and i am in the middle of it and i'm ex i'm ex excited because i'm in the middle of it i am i am i have the ability to to even if it just changes the, the industry by one degree today, you know, in time, that one degree becomes a, a giant angle. Mm. Speaking of things, right? Question yeah. from Joan. Um, she yes. says, Listen, coming from a personal point of view, as someone who's so passionate about the watch industry, what was your first reaction when news on the cancellation of Basel World was announced? And how do you think it'll change the way the, the industry is run in the next three to five years? Okay, so the Basel World, it's a very, it's a, that's a trick question because they did not announce cancellation first. They Brand announced the uh, postponed. Yes, yes, yes. 
you know, right. it's because you know we were in the in the in the thick of the COVID nineteen. I kind of, I guess everybody kind of expected that it wouldn't it won't it won't be able to 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 continue to continue. Um, I I am nervous, yet I am also uh, excited about the the next three to five years as a watch collector as someone who's passionate about watches i am very excited to see that um, the brands are gathered together to have to host an international event under the same time frame i think right. we talk about sustainability corporate responsibility you know and then why do we not talk about carbon footprint right so I think it's important that you know we are also doing what we are doing to the environment. I mean, if we are hosting it under one time frame in one city, that absolutely would do good for the environment just to begin with. So in the next three or five years, Sean, you're right. I think it's a, it's a big shift, big change um, because of the, uh, the the economic hardship. It's um, some of the brands might not survive. I think some of the smaller brand might might disappear. Mm. You will leave with the the stronger brands, the brands who are able to to weather this storm. Um, who also have a it, it doesn't it doesn't mean that it has to be a a, a, um, a wealthy brand uh, that that will help, but also brands who have a very dedicated, uh, very strong following. And these comes with the brand's identity, their DNA, their their ideology, their theory behind the brand. I think these these brands will will go through this period without with no problem. And you have brands who are you know are you this are you this you know you're not too sure. They may suffer. So um, in a way, I think. A lot of at today at this point, I can't say because we don't know when this is over. It might be over in a month. It might be over in a year. I don't know. So I am like the rest of the world. I don't have the, the, the crystal ball to, to tell you uh, what's happening in the future. But I, I generally, I tend to be optimistic. Right. On that note, um, we also know that Rolex, Patek, um, Chopin, and a few other brands have left um, Basel World to start their own show and in uh, conjunction with FHH. You know what? Can you share with us about that? Yes, uh, I can share with you uh, what I read on that uh, press release. <laughs> it, it's it, <laughs> FHH is uh, we have we have two two teams. We have a uh, event team and we have the cultural team. I am on the cultural team, but uh, what I can say is uh, it 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 will happen in the same time frame. Um, it's going to be. Uh, is it under the same roof? I, I, I can't tell you. I don't know. Uh, but I would expect that it, it would happen under the same time frame in the same city. So that, to me, already is a move um, forward. It's a move that we can, we can expect some goodness out of it. I think it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's great that we become uh, a, a force that is more concentrated tell you about the watches and wonder platform unfortunately it did not take place this year the watches and wonder platform is more catered to b2c so it's mm -hmm. a lot more about the consumer and i think this is the right direction um hopefully 2021 we will finally see the watches and wonders uh, in geneva uh, if you are from the U.S., uh, you would have experienced um, Watches and Wonder Miami, which will be somewhat like that, but in a more, uh, in a bigger, um, it will become, be more catered to the consumer. We forums. We Constant seems to be breaking up, right? You know, for other brands. Okay. Right, Sorry, Carson. Carson, still there? Have we lost Carson? No. <laughs> so maybe Carson, you can just... Your questions? 
maybe you can just just exit the the chat first and then uh, come back in again later. So yeah, I think we've lost Carsten. The 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 internet has gotten a bit wonky over there. Uh, we also actually uh, asked him earlier about his favorite watches from uh, the, the 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 fair, and then he actually uh, um, sort of uh, sort like of gave some 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 ideas of what he actually liked. And um, yeah, sure. Let me share some of his uh, watches. So this one uh, that Carson uh, picked, I am speaking so much on his behalf right now, <laughs> would be the uh, Vacheron Constantin uh, uh, Perpetual Calendar Ultra Thin uh, Skeleton Watch, which is uh, one of the um, you know highlights of uh, Vacheron Constantin this year. And it has uh, a very interesting um, movement that is uh, ultra thin. And it has uh, has a very classic execution on a very um, new um, sort of a new collection. In that uh, it has a very sports um, uh, sports uh, inspired sensibility. Yeah. And uh, it has uh, a very cl uh, classic kind of a decorative um, um, execution at the same time. Hey, Carson. Hey, Carson. Sorry, I think someone <laughs> went over oh, in my way. Favorite watches. Liberty of like... Um, um, <laughs> Explain your favorite watches. <laughs> so I started with the VC uh, QP, Skeleton uh, Watch. I think we lost him again. Okay, back to you, Elvin. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, just give me a minute and uh, let me add him to the screen. So this model comes in both um, a leather strap and a bracelet as well, right? And this is yeah. the old version? Uh, this is the leather strap version. Yeah, just give me a minute. Let me just try to figure out. Are we back? Yes. We are Hang on. Okay. Are you freezing again? No, I'm okay. Are you okay? Yeah. yeah. So, like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> desperately trying to fill up the dead air. So, yeah. No, don't I... worry. Tell me. Uh, so, do, where do where do we where do we leave? Are uh, you talking about the new watches now? Yes. Uh, we were talking a bit about uh, Rolex and Patek at FHH. And then, uh, yeah, things went a bit wonky, and uh, we started to talk about the new watches. <laughs> I was just trying to like pull stuff out of the back, and yeah, we were showing this. This is one of your uh, highlights yes. of twenty, right? Yes, yes, yes. I love this piece. You want to all this? Yeah, talk us through it. The the new overseas ultra thin perpetual calendar in in skeleton so yeah. this is not i mean it's not new new it, it they had it last year so this year the new newness of it is the skeletonized uh, dial uh, i love the fact that they are using um, a more traditional way to do the skeletonization uh, you will see a lot of brands who are calling I, I think people who are looking at skeleton watches needs to realize that there's actually two schools of skeleton watches there's one that is the new way of 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 using a um, um, uh, machine to cut and then to finish it, and then using different uh, material to finish it. And then there's the traditional way, and this is I think it's a very it's a very refreshing uh, to see brands who are still using this um, uh, traditional way to make it. And the fact that it's ultra thin, size is excellent. I, I love this piece. I just couldn't afford it. <laughs> Before we get to the new watches, uh, more new highlights for you, right? Can we uh, maybe answer a question from Hazel? Uh, yes. Who wants to ask uh, whether you can share with her uh, one of the good emotional stories 
that was done right by some of the watchmaking brands. Well, I know Hazel. Hi, Hazel. Um, I think brands who are who got lost in this period of everyone talking about mechanical uh, marvel, how complicated the pieces are and such. Uh, you know, just not all brands are like that. Some of the brands are very mechanically uh, strong. Some are not, you know. Um, I think brands who are able to recognize their strength um, communicate much better with their, with their consumer, with their following, with their loyal customer. Um, because on one hand, it is, it, you have to be confident to say, look, we're not doing that. We're, our customer is not about uh, mechanical stuff or, or, or complicated stuff. Uh, it's about you know, a certain style, a certain emotional um, uh, communication. Uh, I think brands who come back to to this and realize what they are strong in is much more attractive than just blindly following uh, whatever the, 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 the trend is. Mm. Are there any um, brands, uh, the highlights that you've picked that actually sort of uh, demonstrates what you just talked about? What did I pick? I picked... Uh, you picked... Uh, the Piaget, well, there. Like, P Piaget, there you go. Piaget is always about ultra thin, right? Mm -hmm. It's always ultra, always about ultra thin. This you can't. I I like to see someone break the record on this, <laughs> right? This is like the size of a, a a coin. Amazing piece. This is absolutely amazing. I am very much looking forward to having. I saw the prototype. I, I mean, I saw the the uh, the the one that came out. You know, three years ago, yeah. I saw that I had it in hand. I played with it. This is even more refined. Look at the lux that it's at an angle. Uh, it's it's it should wear much better on the wrist. Uh, I am totally looking forward to seeing this piece. I, mm -hmm. I just sat through uh, a meeting with the uh, Piaget with uh, Mark here in Hong Kong, uh, and we talked very deep into the. The mechanical side of this thing i i am amazed this is there's no complication it's hour and minute there's no complication but it's it's amazing in terms of what they have achieved by getting it down to that two millimeter that is um, that is just jaw dropping i mean even even a, if, a, if it's a um, um quartz piece i think that the battery itself it's probably that thick mm. Okay, we have one. Uh, Another question here, um, from Sean Mozadek. He's asking, would Cartier be an example of a brand that went a little too far deep into haute horlogerie when their real strength has been case design for the longest time, as amazing as Carol's work was in the past decade or so? I think Cartier is very strong in terms of setting. Um, it, it, it's a it's a trend setting brand. I mean, look at all the pieces that they have. Look at look at the tank. How many how many um, uh, models that you can find on the market that started in the early 1900 until today? That if you pick out the watch and block the 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 brand name, that you can still recognize it. So I agree with Sean. I think. One of their strengths is the, the case or, or the whole design of the watch, right? The tank, Pasha. Uh, I love the, the relaunch of the Pasha. Um, in the in 1980s, Pasha was designed by um, uh, Gerald Genta, which is another one of my favorite watch designers. Um, it's great to see them coming to, to focus on, on, on very simple pieces. I think... Uh, I, it's on my Instagram today. I, I, I think I posted something like simplicity is the highest form of sophistication. This is, I think simple watch has their own attractiveness. It's not just something that I need, although I like complication, you know, but it's mm -hmm. not just something that you only can find uh, it to be very uh, attractive if it's a, 
15 complications on a watch, uh, mm. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I really like the, I mean, I'm not a, 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 a woman, of course, but I really like the new bracelet watch. Uh, how do you pronounce it? The Mylon? The Cartier? Mio. The what? The, the bracelet watch from Cartier. M A I L L O N. We have to pronounce French words. <laughs> Yeah, I don't speak French. That looks like a huge, like thick, uh, you know, hip hop chain with the asymmetrical uh, case and the asymmetrical uh, 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 bracelet. I haven't seen any. I, I, I have a schedule. I, I, end of June. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to see the, the piece in person, mm. to touch it and uh, feel it. Yeah, I want to share this on the screen as well. This one is another one of your highlights. Yeah. The, the Lange minute repeater. I love to to see, to hear the performance uh, in person. I haven't. I I I've heard the 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 the, the previous piece, but this time it's in uh, uh, white gold, and I want mm. to see the because different material will yield different performance in terms of the sound. So I, mm -hmm. I really much looking forward to, to Lange. I think Lange has done a good job this year. Um, I, again, I, I want to see uh, this piece in person to try it, um, to see how uh, the case material would change the performance of the, of the chime. What are your thoughts on the so-called sports watch that they have, though, the uh, Odysseus? Um, interesting that they, I was expecting them to come up with a steel with the rubber bracelet, a uh, rubber band, mm. but, uh, no, it, it, it became a white gold one. So, mm. um, it's, uh, it's interesting. I want to see, I, again, I want to see how, uh, they are making the, the locks, uh, fit into the bracelet. Um, again, because of the, of the virus this year. Uh, I guess. Have you seen it in person? Uh, we've seen no, yeah. only the 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 one, the one in yeah, 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 yeah. I want to see the one in the in the precious metal, well, mm -hmm. with the with the strap and the uh, and the rubber strap. So yeah. um, it's it's interesting. I and I understand a lot of a lot of consumer have a big. Um, reaction when a brand comes out with the uh, with a slightly different looking piece mm. i mean mm. look you have you have patek philippe i mean if we if we take a time machine travel back into the 70s you have patek philippe making the nautilus my goodness i i can i can only imagine in 1976 when the nautilus came out people probably were really reacting to it in a, in a in a shocking way because it looks nothing like the rest of the of the of the line right uh, last year you have but i agree with it because how do you how do you develop how do you grow your 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 client base if you keep on making the same thing mm. right so mm. i agree um, on the other hand you you have a product that does not cannibalize your own product today we have we have BMW M1, M2, M3, M4, M5. It, it's like it's too many M. It, it, to me, it used to be just M3 and M5. Now there's like M4. Well, what's the difference between M4 and M3, and then M5? It, it you know now they have an M2. You know right. I, I'm lost. So um, I actually think I agree with brands like that. Look, Moser, uh, Moser, they've been making this traditional. Uh, Fume dial, and then this year they came out with a streamliner, and I think it's yeah. it's excellent. Okay, is it to my taste? Maybe not, but it's uh, I, I agree with the strategy of the brands. Bell and mm. Ross uh, with the bracelet watch, I, I I agree with that too. I think it's a it's an excellent way to develop. I mean, if I worked for the company, if I were to develop a product, that's exactly how I would do it too. Like to your point about how people were reacting very. Uh strongly to something that was new back in the 70s people are re reacting very strongly to what is like similar to what has been done before these days like you talked about the bell and ross right and then you know you have uh maybe uh jira pirago the loretto watch and so many uh chopin alpine eagle and people are reacting to it in such a strong way because 
this watches pay homage to a sports watch of that time, you know, of a certain era and a certain uh, ilk, you know, yeah. as opposed to, you know, what was like before when things were different. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we also have like um, watch lovers who complain when brands, all they do in the new collection is change the dial colors or change the, the material of the case, you know. So when, when brands actually do something um, really different from what they, they normally do, I think it's something that, you know, it, it should be celebrated. I think you're right. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a good way. Look at, the reaction, look at the reaction on the AP1159. Yes. Yeah. Wow, that was really right. strong. Wow. Yeah. But look at it in the commercial aspect. You know, you, you got to look at it in the commercial aspect. You, I understand. I understand that, you know, you need to go into a different direction so that you don't keep on making the same piece with a little okay. bit twist on and the change. So you don't have to like it, but I, I, I understand the, the direction of the brand that they're taking. Mm -hmm. Mm. I guess, like, again, I think we've talked about this a bit before, about how, you know, probably the Royal Oak, when it first came out, didn't wasn't a huge commercial success right off the bat, you know. It, it, of, of, oftentimes, it takes a lot of uh, time, hindsight to appreciate, like, something that was new before. So, I guess and maybe... And that's the same, and well, that's the same with, with cars. Mm. Some of the cars in the, in the 60s, in the 50s, in the 70s, when it first came out, it was not popular. It was not popular. It was frowned upon the the Porsche 914 that I, I have. It's a it was not it was like the the it was like the ugly duckling. Uh, nobody likes it. Suddenly now in recent years it became popular again. So it's you know it's it's it's, it's something that's uh, similar to the watch industry. Okay. I just want to bring up this last piece that. Uh, yes. Uh, I love this. Is one of your highlights for uh, the year. You want to talk yeah. about it? So, the F.P. Jean um, Perpetual Calendar, this time around, it's not brand new, but the, the, the way that they have done on the dial is amazing. I mean, they took, mm -hmm. a, they took away that the stainless steel circle. And it made the watch look a lot more uh, coherent. To me, it's, it's an excellent piece. Now, uh, with this, I think perpetual calendar, you need to really have a good looking uh, uh, a perpetual calendar in terms of uh, the, whole, the whole feel to it. Or you have a very legible uh, perpetual calendar. So this is one of the most legible perpetual calendar on the market. And I love the movement. Is, is, is really easy to correct as well, right? It's just a single crown operation. Correct, yes, yes. Hmm. And you, you have all the information on the dial. You don't need to, you don't need to, it's, it's one glance hmm. and you can, you can see all the information that you want. And I love the way that they put the, the, um, uh, the power reserve at nine o'clock. It's, it's very symmetrical. I like symmetrical dials. Hmm. I mean the, the 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 image that we see here is like at four four ten as well. So everything uh, looks a bit more <laughs> symmetrical as well. That's true. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Carson, for taking the time out to chat with us today. I think you know we've really learned a lot, and it's been wonderful to hear your insights in the watch industry. So thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. I think, uh, you know, for all those viewers, if you have questions, I, you could reach me. I, I'm happy to answer your questions. Um, I'm a watch geek deep inside. So you ask me any geeky question if you want. Um, what is your Instagram handle? Uh, the Carson Chan, T-H-E Carson Chan. Okay. Yeah. The okay let me just, just put it up. The Carson C-H-A-M. Hey, and, and we did an hour 14, huh? Yeah. Is that Long a record? Uh, yes, it is. a <laughs> record. <laughs> Always with you. So Yay. that's Carlton's um, Instagram handle. If you have any questions, uh, you can follow him on Instagram, of course. And if you have any more questions about FHH, about watches, you want to geek out, uh, he's a 
it's re really the right person to do so. Yeah, but we also have uh, Max Ching who says, Hi, Carson, thanks for bringing FHH certification to Singapore. So, yes, thank you very much for that. Yes, thank you to Max. Yes, I, I did visit. I visited Singapore many times that year, thanks to Max. <laughs> <laughs> right. Cecil, thank you so much for uh, tuning in as well. Thank right. you. Okay, thank you, guys. Have a good thank evening. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye. See you. Bye.